Happy Sabbath, everyone. It is so good to be worshiping with you this morning. Um, yes, I am indeed married to but one wife. And um, I've got two wonderful, beautiful boys uh, who sometimes uh, just drives me crazy. But nonetheless, I love them to bits, and um, I'm, I'm grateful for God. Um, this morning, uh, I almost didn't make it with Elder Mandla. Um, I, I was in extreme pain for the last two days, back pain. And I was wondering, should I just message him and say, listen, man, I, I don't think I'm going to make it. But nonetheless, um, I prayed about it. God is good. I'm here this morning, even though I am in pain. Um, this morning, I am, um, it's an, a real honor and privilege to be standing here. I just was thinking about it in this week. The last time I was standing here uh, was many years back when uh, Pastor Doug Batchelor was here. And you can imagine how, how long that was. And um, I'm extremely grateful to be here worshiping with you. So this morning, I have a special message for you from God. Um, I, it took me a couple of months actually to study this topic. It's all about visioneering, um, about, you know, it's actually the, the title of my sermon, Visioneering, it's about biblical leadership. And um, I'm hoping and praying that God will bless each and every one uh, the same way he has blessed me when I was preparing this. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear God, we come before your throne and you know the, why everyone is here this morning. Father God, you know what challenges they have gone through and you know how important it is for them to listen and learn about the special topic that you have laid on my heart. Father, let it not be me that's been seen, but let it be you. Because a lot of times, Father God, we stand here and many of us uh, got ego and all these kind of things that tend to uh, get the word across properly. So I pray that you will make me humble and help me to be able to share a word that is not just uh, empowering, but also an enlightening uh, in terms of uh, what you want us to know. Be with us now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. So many years back, there was a man by the name of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was a visionary leader and an innovative inventor. If you read about uh, the history of Steve Jobs and about Apple, you will see that Steve Jobs was basically kicked out of his own company. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but Steve Jobs, when Apple was going through a dip, Steve Jobs was called back. Now, he was an extremely passionate um, inventor, uh, especially about the, the products he created. Right? Uh, he believed in creating beautiful and functional products that uh, would help uh, the human race uh, or at least make their lives better. One day, Steve Jobs was struck by an idea for an, a device that would combine a phone, a music player, and the internet. And he wanted to create this product into one sleek, user-friendly package. He believed that this device could revolutionize the way people communicate and work and live. Now, Steve was deeply involved in every aspect of this device's development, from the design of, uh, to the software development to the marketing. He was committed to creating a product that not only um, was technologically advanced, but also aesthetically pleasing and easy to use. In 2007, Steve Jobs introduced this device to the world. He called it the iPhone. Who here um, had one of those original iPhones? I know I had. You know, I was uh, a fanboy back then. 
um, uh, Apple uh, fanatic. Uh, I mean, I, I even use uh, their products uh, on my day-to-day -day working environment. But right now, uh, I only use Apple for work purposes, but when it comes to phone, uh, I've decided that it's probably best just to go the cheaper route and buy products that are more lesser or of more affordable. If you look at uh, today's age, um, you know, nappies are expensive, so I don't know why I would still want to focus on that. You know, um, also, uh, the other day I was, uh, went to the shop and like, man, why for seven potatoes, it cost about 70 bucks. I'm like, are you, are you like 10 rand a potato? So like, no ways, man. So nowadays, I'd rather go the cheaper route than focusing on, um, you know, products that are people seeing as just like a, a little of a, a status symbol. Now, the iPhone became one of the most successful and influential products in history, sparking a revolution in mobile computing and transforming the way people interact with technology. Jobs' leadership and vision were instrumental in the creation of the iPhone, and his commitment to innovation and design continues to inspire and shape the technology industry today. His legacy is a testament to the power of imagination, creativity, and perseverance in pursuit of a better world. Today, I want to explore this concept called visioneering, which may sound like a new term, but it's actually rooted in an age-old idea. What is that, you may ask? Let me explain it to you through the words of a, in my eyes, a brilliant writer called Andy Stanley, who wrote a very inspiring book called Visioneering, um, that actually inspired the sermon today. And in this book, Andy Stanley describes visioneering as the process of turning dreams into reality where ideas and convictions gain tangible form. He illustrates visioneering as the engineering of a vision, much like how Steve Jobs passionately pursued his vision in creating a beloved product, often pushing his team to their limits in order to bring that vision to life. During my research on Christian leadership the, and, and the art of setting visions uh, for various aspects of your life, such as uh, you know, the church, your business, uh, family, nonprofit organizations, and so on and so forth, I discovered that, they, that visioneering, um, there's about four essential elements that shape our daily experiences. There is passion, motivation, direction, and then there is purpose. Now, Andy Stanley emphasizes the importance of passion when it comes to visioneering. He says that passion fuels our pursuits. It ignites our altruism. It gives us the drive to persevere through challenges and obstacles. It is the deep inner fire that uh, propels us forward. Then motivation, he says motivation also plays an important or a crucial role in visioneering. It is the why behind our actions, the compelling force that keeps us focused and dedicated to our vision. Motivation provides the necessary fuel to sustain our efforts and overcome setbacks. Direction is another vital component. Without a clear direction, our vision can become aimless and ineffective. Understanding the specific part we need to follow and having a well-defined plan of action. This enables us to make intentional progress towards our desired outcome. Then lastly, purpose. Now purpose gives us meaning and significance to our visioneering endeavors. It is the understanding that our vision serves a greater purpose beyond ourselves. Recognizing the impact 
our vision can have on others and aligning it with our core values um, to pursue our dreams with a sense of fulfillment and contribution. Now that we have an understanding of what visioneering entails, I'm going to be looking at a very special character in the Bible that I'm hoping will inspire all of us to focus more on what God has in store for us. It was the year 587 BC. It was a devastating, um, let me, before I carry on, my whole sermon is going to be focused on the book of Nehemiah, right? I'm focusing on at least about four chapters. So I'm not going to go verse by verse. I'm looking at chapter by chapter by chapter, all right? So it will be the first six chapters in the book of Nehemiah. So like I was saying, it was the year 587 BC. It was a, a devastating event unfolded in the ancient city of Jerusalem. King Nebuchadnezzar, for the third time, led his Babylonian forces in an invasion that would leave the city and the magnificent temple built by King Solomon in ruins. The biblical records recount the city's destruction with each campaign resulting in the capture and exile of Israelites to Babylon. It was during the initial uh, or first invasion a young man by the name of Daniel, along with his three friends, found themselves taken as captives to this foreign land called Babylon. They were uh, uprooted, basically, from their homeland, and they were forced to adapt to a new culture and a new way of life. Years later, after the death of King Nebuchadnezzar, the mighty Babylonian Empire crumbled, and before the rising power of the Medo Persian, uh, the new rulers, known for their more lenient approach, issued a decree that they would allow the exiles to return to their homelands. The book of Ezra, which is often uh, grouped with Nehemiah, describes the account of this edict and the subsequent efforts to reconstruct the land of Judah. It is during this time that we discover our brother Nehemiah, who basically did not return back home. Instead, he chose to serve in the royal courts of Susa. Now, the book, well, actually, there's multiple books. The books of Ezra, uh, Esther, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and there are possibly others. They collectively are referred to as the post exilic writings. They narrate the events that transpired after the Babylonian uh, invasion and, and the period of the exile. It is important to note that these books are not arranged in chronological order. Right? By the time Nehemiah came around, the significant reconstruction and rebuilding had already taken place in Jerusalem. However, Due to various challenges, including opposition and internal conflicts, the work remained unfinished. Now I want us to transport ourselves to the opening pages of the book of Nehemiah. In chapter 1, we find ourselves in the winter citadel of uh, the palace of Susan, also known as Susa, where, which is basically the same place where Ahazaria's grand feast took place. I did some research and they say that this feast lasted about 180 days. Also, th this same place where Nehemiah, Nehemiah is finding himself is the place where, in the book of Esther, where Daniel had his vision in Daniel 8. It was the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign in the month of Shizlu, uh, which is approximately December, January of the year. It was during this time that Nehemiah received some devastating news. You see, Hananani and a group of men came from Judah, 
uh, they came to visit him. And Nehemiah, being concerned about the condition of the people back home, he asked him, he inquired of them, listen, tell me, what is going on in Jerusalem? Basically, these men told Nehemiah, or they gave him some news that was very devastating to him. Thus, the response he received shattered his heart. They, they told him that our people are facing great trouble and are a disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem lie in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. This news struck a chord within Nehemiah and he couldn't contain his emotions. The Bible teaches us that Nehemiah wept. His grief, he, the Bible teaches, also teaches us that he mourned and he fasted and he prayed for days on end. Now, while I was studying this, this thought came to mind. Why would a grown man, why would a grown man who, I mean, you probably have to be all uh, positive and um, all of these kind of uh, characteristics he had to add in front of the king, why would he go and cry? The Bible said he wept. You see, beloved, Nehemiah's response reveals something deeper. He had a, or he was burdened, and this burden revealed something great. This burden developed into a vision. A vision was born out of the concern he had for his people and his nation. While I was re uh, reading up and researching about the life of Nehemiah, I realized that this powerful story was a reminder that we as Christians shouldn't settle for mediocrity. Like Nehemiah, we should always strive for perfection and for excellence. I have personally adopted a, uh, a philosophy that uh, basically guides my work. And this comes from the book of Colossians 3, verse 23. And uh, I'm just going to paraphrase it. Every time I keep on telling myself that whatever I do, I need to do it as I'm doing it for the Lord. Amen. And um, sometimes my, uh, um, I run my own business, and uh, I've got a few staff members, and uh, I, I can see that sometimes they get frustrated with me when I... When we do work, I expect them to do it perfectly. And I, the reason why I'm like that is because I believe that whatever you do, whether it be a position in church, whether it be at work, whether it be with your children, you should make sure that you have a standard that you are living towards. There are times, and I was thinking about it this week, there are times when I feel like, man, I'm just going to do things halfway and then, um, especially when I'm at home, um, I don't like. I'm just. I don't have. I don't feel like doing it properly. And then I have this little voice. Um, it's not. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's my wife actually. <laughs> it's like, listen, you. Uh, you are so heavy on trying to do everything perfect, but now you are. Your kids, you don't even show them. And they're like, okay, you. Yeah, let me just do it perfectly. Let me just sort it out. And um, this is something I believe we as Christians, especially in God's church, and, and I get frustrated. Beloved, I get frustrated when even in church people, um, they can give 110% for their boss, but when it comes to God, they always want to do things halfway. And that's why at times I had to repent of it because I'm always someone that if someone don't do it right, I'll do it myself. And I had to learn, listen, Robert, be patient. God was patient with you, so you have to be patient with him. It's interesting to see how um, Nehemiah's dissatisfaction with the average led him to take action. 
The first thing Nehemiah did was he prayed. Prayer was Nehemiah's secret to being a great leader. Prayer is very powerful, beloved. Prayer was Nehemiah's way of depending on God for guidance and strength. In my research uh, on Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 1, I discovered that there were four components that um, made his prayer so powerful. The first one is adoration, then confession, then promises, then vision. Now, let's just quickly take a look at at those four components. Why, when Nehemiah prayed, he, he began by acknowledging God's greatness. He used various titles to describe God uh, and recognized his faithfulness. Nehemiah's prayer was centered on God and not himself. It is a powerful reminder that our prayers should be focused on adoring God and recognizing his sovereignty. Then we come to confession. Confession played a significant role in Nehemiah's prayer. He recognized that sin creates a barrier between us and God. With humility, he confessed not only his own sins, but the sins of Israel. Nehemiah identified with the corporate sin of his people, seeking, uh, seeking forgiveness and, and pure motives. His act of, uh, of taking spiritual responsibility for others' wrongdoing is a trait found in other biblical greats. Then Nehemiah, he also reminded God of his promises. He believed that God would be faithful to his word. This gave Nehemiah the confidence to boldly approach, and to approach the throne of God and trust him for his faithfulness. Just as Nehemiah relied on God's promises, we too can find assurance in God's faithfulness to his word and to fulfill his word. Through prayer, Nehemiah's vision became clear. He understood his role as the cupbearer to the king and he saw an opportunity to meet a great need. Nehemiah's prayer helped establish priorities and gave him a sense of purpose. Prayer it has the power to align our hearts with God's plans and reveal his vision for our lives. It is worth noting that when we receive a vision from God, it may not always require immediate action. The Bible teaches us that Nehemiah waited for four months, beloved, for four months before receiving an answer to his prayers. It was during those four months that Nehemiah planned meticulously. He prepared himself for when God would open up a door. And God did. It was during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign. It was during the month of Nisan that Nehemiah got an answer to his prayer. As many of us know, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. What many people don't know is that his role went far beyond merely tasting wine. He was the king's intimate advisor, his personal bodyguard, the overseer of the royal vineyards and all that pertained to the king's drink. Imagine the weight of responsibility that was on Nehemiah's shoulders. You see, beloved, he was entrusted in ensuring the well-being of the whole royal household. In some cultures, cupbearers would even risk their lives by drinking or tasting everything before the king before to avoid him being poisoned. So when Nehemiah appeared with a sad countenance, the king couldn't ignore it. 
Something was not right with Nehemiah. And so the king started asking questions. Beloved, remember Nehemiah was praying for this for four months. And now, while he was standing there in front of the king, in that very moment, God was about to open up a door for him. Yes, it taught for us as Christians. Instead of praying for miracles, we should pray for an opportunity to play our part. As I was telling you about Andy Stanley, so Andy Stanley, he wisely suggests, our visions involves us. We as Christians have a role to play. So as we pray for open doors, let's also be intentional in our planning. Nehemiah did not just pray about the situation. He also planned meticulously for when that opportunity would arise. It's no use we just pray, but we don't plan. It's almost like I say, God, please bless me with work, but I don't hand in service. It just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Now, I want to quickly tell you a story about um, something I, that happened many years back. Like I was saying, I was, uh, the elder was saying, um, he introduced me as I was part of the Amen missions team many years back. And um, many of you know Leon and Justin, all the guys, Grant, Apple, Kurt, Kempfer, and all those guys. We, one of the things that we used to do is we would set audacious goals. Like, if I think about the stuff we achieved over the few years, it, was just, it just blows my mind every time. Yeah, we were young people wanting to do amazing things and educate and help others grow in the spiritual walk and especially doing missionary work for God. One year specifically, we set ourselves a, a target or a goal, and that was to get the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism. Uh, we wanted them to come to Cape Town. What many people don't realize is that we planned this thing for two years. I think it was about two years. We prayed about it, we fasted, and we asked God to open up doors for us. And it's amazing how God just works in such a, a wonderful way that by us getting all those speakers to Cape Town, God allowed us to connect with the right people who assisted us to get to the AFCO guys. And you know what? Eventually, we connected with them. They decided that they were going to come down. But what was the cherry on top was Doug Batchelor agreeing to come to Cape Town as well. And we were just over the moon because here we have been praying and planning this thing for quite some time and God just made every door open. Beloved, the event we organized today in Peru, I think, was the biggest event of our lives, I think. And what many don't realize is that it took a lot of sacrifice. It took many a times we would organize the, these conferences and we don't have any budget. We don't have any money. We had to start all over and raise funds and all of these things. But God always came through in miraculous ways. Right, back to my sermon. So Nehemiah was standing in front of the king. His heart was racing with fear. He knew that he had to explain the sorrow that was etched on his face. With tact and wisdom, Nehemiah chose his words very carefully, demonstrating the qualities of a good servant and a leader. Let's explore this tactful approach quickly. So the first one is that 
the method. Nehemiah employed an artful manner of speaking to the king. He began with the phrase, let the king live forever. Thus subtly refuting any notion of assassination or discontent. Instead of defending himself or denying the accusation, he responded with another question. Perhaps to evoke compassion or to convey the burden that God has placed on his heart. Just like Jesus, who often responded with questions, the method of answering was important as the content itself. Then the second one is reason. Nehemiah appealed to the king's inner empathy. By mentioning his ancestors' graves, he tapped into a shared human emotion that transcends cultural boundaries. He wisely avoided using the city's name, Jerusalem, which could have triggered a political recollections or controversies. Nehemiah saw the king not as a political opponent, but as a fellow human being. And he responded accordingly. So after explaining his plight to the king, we see that Nehemiah was granted permission to go and do what he asked the king. One of the remarkable aspects of the story found in chapter 2 is that before Nehemiah answered the king, the Bible says that he prayed on the spot. Nehemiah prayed and then with confidence he presented his carefully crafted request. Nehemiah meticulously laid out his plans which he worked on for those four months. It's it's very interesting that everything Nehemiah told the king is something that he he planned carefully. And he said, king, this, that, and the other. I want this, that, and the other. And the king said, okay, Nehemiah, how long will you be gone? Nehemiah gave him a, a time frame and then off he went. Now, Planning is crucial to any successful um, campaign or wherever you find yourself. Now, like I was saying, I run my own business, and at the beginning of this year, I decided that I was going to go away for a few days. I went away to uh, Langeban, and I, I just for, the, for, for a couple of days, I spent the, I call it the Think Week, what I do is I would write down things during the year, and then it's just like when I have time, I'll think about it. And during this think, during this think week, um, I decided that I was going to create a five-year uh, business plan. A five-year business plan. I worked out how, and, and I, the question I asked myself is, what would I do if someone would invest in my business? And then I started planning and planning. Now, beloved, why I did that, I don't know. But what I do know is that if someone should come around with the opportunity, I want to be ready. And this is what I did. Because a lot of times, we don't like to plan, we just go with the flow. But I believe in setting goals for yourself, for your family, whatever you do, and then if in 10 years' time you want to be there, you work your way down. And you know that we've got a goal, and that's what we want to do, and this is how we're going to achieve it. And there will be obstacles in our way, and we want to be prepared for that. So, Nehemiah got to go ahead. I don't know how long it took him to prepare himself, but I know that he was super excited to get to Jerusalem. Now, Nehemiah, one of the things when I I was thinking about it, as he got closer to Judah, I just can't imagine what went through his mind. His heart probably started skipping a beat. He probably started thinking about 
the challenges that lays ahead of him. And we see that as he moved or he got closer to the city, his um, arrival didn't go unnoticed. People were probably wondering, why is there a, a Persian official and his entourage entering our city? You know, we, are, we are, as human beings, we are a little bit nosy at times. Something goes on outside. Uh, we always want to go and see what's happening. And um, they were probably wondering, who is this guy? Why did he come? What, who's in charge? Now, what's interesting to note is that the Bible says that Nehemiah did not immediately disclose his purpose. Instead, he quietly investigated and surveyed the situation in Jerusalem for about three days. The Bible teaches us that he went during the, the, the cover of darkness, and uh, that's where he, he took down notes. Uh, he didn't want to, to let people know the real purpose of his journey. Here's a valuable lesson for us. Sometimes it is wise to keep our plans to ourselves until the right time. Not everyone will share the exact or the same excitement about the ways God has guided you, that way you're feeling about it. And this is something I've experienced over and over and over again. There will be many naysayers and there will be many obstacles that will hinder the work God has placed in your heart. I remember um, many years back, I had this great desire just to, I was staying in Easter of and I had this great desire just to do outreach in our area. And someone said to me, listen man, uh, you can't go there to the parking lot. The securities will chase you away. And now there's something about me that you should know. Um, I thrive on people who tell me I can't do something. As when someone says, no, Robert, you can't do this. Like, like man, I'm going to show you. I remember growing up as a young person in school. That <laughs> um, Our maths teacher said, we, uh, we, were, we were very naughty. So... Uh, we, the whole class, we um, decided not to attend his, his class. We just stayed away. And then when he, he was extremely angry, that teacher. And he said, all of you are going to fail. And when he said that, there's something in my mind just went ping. And I said, teacher, I'm going to show you. I didn't tell him that in exact words. I'm just in my mind. I'm like, I'm going to show you. And I actually passed his, 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 his subject. Even I didn't pass it the way I wanted to, but I, I passed the subject. And that's where how I, my mind works. And this, is, this principle, when I was studying this, um, and when I moved to Marmesbury as well, I said, look, I, I, just, I went around and I said, like, I want to do this, that, and the other. And then I afterwards, after studying Nehemiah's life, I realized that it's probably best just to st stand backwards for a little while and get to know the people, understand the issues, the, the challenges that's in the church. And now I feel like I'm at the stage where I'm ready to take on this great mission God has laid on my heart. And that's why it's important that we should study the Bible and the Word of God. The Bible will teach us so many things that we uh, sometimes take for granted. Now, just as uh, Nehemiah assessed the situation in Jerusalem uh, before unveiling his purpose, I think we can follow this same example. We should really, like one of the things Nehemiah did was, the Bible teaches us that he approached the priest. I, I've come to realize that it is important for us to engage the leadership in our church as well. It is important for us to engage the influences in our church or our community or at work or wherever we are finding ourselves. When Nehemiah approached the key figures in the church, the Bible says that they all got involved. 
they, he knew that they were able to inspire and encourage uh, the, the, the folks, uh, his people, to get involved in this great work. He understood that their help will be critical in this mission. Beloved, through studying the life of Nehemiah, I've learned that we as a people need to work together. If you want to achieve greater things for God, we all need to get on board. The Bible says that in verse 5 of chapter 3, they mentioned a, a group of people called the Dakotas. Upon careful examination of this entire chapter, we find them again in verse 27, indicating that they had a significant workload. There was Meshulam, the son of Beresia, which was mentioned in verse 4. And later we find this, this person or this guy in verse 30, diligently repairing the wall near his own home. Not only did he fulfill the assigned section, but he also took on additional work to, near his own residence. What's very interesting is that Nehemiah paid attention to every detail. However, the chapter also reveals a less positive aspect. The second half of verse 5 mentions the nobles of the Coitus, who did not actively contribute to the work of God. Large projects often attract individuals who are lazy, indifferent, and or inactive. In this case, the Bible points out that they did not fully commit themselves to the Lord's work. Projects ordained by God should never be taken lightly. I came across uh, this book called, uh, written by Mrs. White called Lessons on the Life of Nehemiah. Uh, in page 17, she says this, Among the first to catch Nehemiah's spirit of zeal and earnestness were the priests of Israel, from the position of influence which they occupied, these men could do much to hinder the, or advance the work. Their ready cooperation at the very outset contributed not a little to its success. Thus should it be in every holy enterprise. Those who occupy positions of influence and responsibility in the church should be foremost in the work of God. If they move reluctantly, others will not move at all. But their zeal will provoke many. When their light burns brightly, a thousand torches will be kindled at the flame. A majority of the nobles and rulers of Israel also came up to their duty. But there were a few, the Dakota nobles, who put not their necks to the work of the Lord. While the faithful builders have honorable mentions mentioned in the book of God, the memory of these slothful servants is branded with shame and handed down as a warning to all future generations. Beloved, today I want to present you with a choice. A choice that will shape, shape the course of your leadership within the church. Will you stand alongside the leaders and actively contribute? Or will you be like these nobles, choosing to stand back and withhold your support? The choice or the decision is yours. Throughout my journey in this Christian walk, I've discovered a recurring pattern. Whenever we embark on God's work, Opposition is inevitably will arise. Surprisingly, this opposition <laughs> emerges from within the church, which is actually disheartening. As leaders, it is essential to recognize that our visions 
will face criticism and challenges. Beloved, we need to take courage in the life of Nehemiah. In chapter 4, Nehemiah's enemies were filled with fury as the construction of Jerusalem's walls continued. It's a man by the name of Sanballat, which launched a relentless campaign of criticism against Nehemiah and the Jews. A formidable alliance formed against Nehemiah's initiative. The Bible says that Sanballat, the governor of Samaria, Tobiah, the Ammonite from the east, Gershom, the Arabian king from the south, and the Astadites from the west, they all conspired against Nehemiah and the Jews. Although, although they could not uh, openly war or wage war against Jerusalem due to Nehemiah's uh, protection from the king, they resorted to ridicule, discouragement, or even violence. They just wanted to hinder the work or the completion of the work. Imagine if finding yourself in Nehemiah's shoes. Many would panic. Many would feel overwhelmed, uncertain. It brings to mind the events that have been happening in South Africa over the last few months. A few months back, South Africa was involved with this whole thing between Russia uh, and Ukraine. And you saw how America um, accused South Africa of uh, selling guns to Russia. And um, it was a huge thing over, all over the news. And America was also pressuring South Africa to take sides and arrest Putin if he should come to South Africa. But, and, and this was during the BRICS summit, but we know <laughs> South Africa said we are non aligned. And uh, eventually Putin decided not to come. Now, as Christian leaders in the church, I can tell you that we will face opposition. If there's one thing that we should be doing as leaders is praying. Beloved, Nehemiah believed in prayer. Prayer holds the key to accomplishing our goals. Personally, I have witnessed miraculous movements of God in my own personal life. The work we did at Amen, the work I'm doing right now, the work I've been doing since I became an Adventist, God has been moving in my life. Allow me to share another story with you. I, I'm a big fan of storytelling, so I like, I like stories. So, a couple of years back, about five or six years back, I told my wife that uh, we just moved into our new house, and I said, listen, in five years' time, we are going to be moving. Back then, it was just ridiculous. We were like, why? We just moved into our new house. Why do we want to move again? Beloved, I continually prayed. I said, I believe that we are not going to stay here forever. Five years' time, we're going to move. And last year, October, it was about five years exactly that we decided it was time to move. And God, everything that happened, I just, I just give God the praise and honor. Because everything that happened, the doors that opened, I kept on saying something must go wrong. But everything, that whole transition was so smoothly that I, just, I, mean, I, I can't praise God enough. And this is the same thing God can do for you. Beloved, now, Nehemiah had all sorts of challenges, all sorts of obstacles that was in his way. We had Sanballat and his crew 
who eventually decided to send men to go and ask Nehemiah to come to a city or area called Ono, and there they wanted to have a meeting. But Nehemiah was a wise man. He knew that if he went down there, something was going to happen to him. Something was going to happen to him. And Nehemiah said some, something very um, profound. He said something that, that I took to heart. He said that I am doing a great work. I cannot go down. As I was meditating on those words, beloved, I realized that, you know what? Whenever we, we feel troubled, whenever we feel like giving up, whenever we feel like we can't go on anymore, I want you to remember those words. I cannot go down. I am doing a great work. Yes. Beloved, several months ago, as I was studying this, I realized that and I, I went through a tough time. I was stressed out. I suffered from anxiety. I went through a lot of challenges. And a couple of weeks back, I was reminded about these words again. Whenever I look at my boys and I, and I want to give up, I tell myself these words, I cannot go down to the level where Satan wants me. I am doing a great work. I actually wrote this down on a sticky note and I put it on my desk at home. And whenever I sit down, I look at it, I said, I am doing a great work, Robert. No matter the pressures, no matter the obstacles, you are doing a great work. Beloved, I urge you to adopt this mindset. When the path seems odious, when the challenges seem insurmountable, remember that you are doing a great work. Embrace the difficulties as opportunities for growth. For they are stepping stones towards fulfilling your vision. Don't be swayed by the allurement of comfort or the pursuits of lesser goals. Stay focused on what matters. Even if it means readjusting your plans along the way. Always remember the power of prayer. Seek God's guidance, wisdom, and strength in every step of your journey. Amen. Beloved, today I call upon you to make a commitment Today I want you to decide, will you be a leader who will rise above opposition, who will persevere in the face of challenges, who will continually seek God's direction, or will you be like the, the Quakers, uh, nobles, who will be happy just to stand back and let others do the work that God has called you to do? What will it be? Let us build a legacy of unwavering faith and dedication, leaving behind a church, a community, a world transformed by the impact of our great work. Time is short, beloved. God is looking for leaders. Will you accept the call? The choice is yours. The good Lord bless you. Amen.